to start you. The program is Basket Starfish. Happy 2020. This is the first time of the new year that my program is on. Uh, I make a resolution that I'm going slower this year. Hopefully it will be easier for people to understand because I bring in you know, more than 20 something years of my traveling. All the sounds that I hear from different countries that I have lived and I have been to. And then I'm comparing all the ancient pictograph together to show you that we did have a common core since ancient time. So all these language families are just one single organism. We all share one common core which uh, we are not different family trees because believing in it we believe in different hierarchy and of course again I will stress that I present to you an Asian point of view and also um, from uh, a, a female perspective okay I'm going to start my slides uh, now um, this week I'm going to uh, continue with uh, the common song of G and K and then uh, going uh, transferring to the S, Sa, song S, okay? And why is the, the G and the S, you know, always present in the same uh, meaning? And I think it's difficult to understand when I say, but when you see the pictures, you will understand. I'll start from the beginning, okay? And here it is. This is... Yeah, again, this is the basket starfish. And again, you know, I think we are not separate family trees. Uh, we all share one single core because believing in uh, different trees develop at different time. We actually built in our human hierarchy and, uh, and I think it needs to be changed. And first of all, I uh, want to give you a jot in your normal thinking uh, to let show you that how much Eurocentric view and patriarchal view that we are constantly being uh, exposed to. First of all, uh, when we all started school, you know, we always given this picture as the Stone Age image, right? So um, there seems to be nothing wrong and nobody seems to question it. But um, if they uh, all the agree that, you know, the original of the people were coming out of Africa, don't you think that it will be a little hot, you know, to wear all those animal skins? Um, so I will show you another picture. And this is a picture of a, a tribal woman from Tanzania in uh, 1924. And look at the, what uh, she's dressing in. Of course, when I look at this picture, I'm also from a tropical place from Asia. Okay, so I always felt that how can we wear that when it was so hot, you know, because I lived in a diff different geographic position. And now, you know, because you don't pay that much attention, you just swallow everything that people give to you and you believe that this is the image of our stone age so uh, I just want to give you a jot to let you think about it again okay again um, I uh, in my past you know episodes you have seen it again and again I try very hard to show you how important it is the grass you know make into our culture because it is from this dry grass that we start to this weaving and plating okay and then even in this uh, very patriarchal uh, view of the stone age you know you you will see that you don't pay attention to these small things because if you look carefully you know who will be the one who make all these threads to bind the things together because otherwise you know there's no way they can put the animal skin on their body okay so uh, I have to remind you behind all those macho stone chipping there will always be a soft power behind it so um, when people started to move away the plating and weaving should be the first technology that human beings started to do uh, um, uh, manipulate. So uh, I think it is a prerequisite to perfect our stone too. Um, I show you also, you know, in my past, you know, episodes uh, to show you when I lived in the uh, very hot, hot desert and when I go to a very, very cold climate, the only thing that you cannot live without is that little humble mat or carpet on the floor. So if without that thing that men can sit down, they can never perfect the tools that they use okay so 
I believe that when humans started to migrate, we already carry many woods. Because if you need to move, you need to eat, you need to hunt, you need to dress yourself to warmth. So without this plating and weaving technology, nothing can happen, okay? So um, again, you know, I think all started from a blade of grass. And uh, from my years of research, it seems to be very normal that actually the sound developed into a lot of different woods. So uh, we always believe that once we come, whither we go, is a very philosophical question. We think that, you know, it's only the 19th century started in Europe in the psychology that people started, or, or philosophy, that people started to think about such problem. No, because uh, I will show you in a lot of ancient writings that human ancestor already pondered on this long, long before writing started. Because when writing started, they already have those elements they were questioning in those uh, pictographs, okay? Uh, first of all, we look at the picture of us, uh, the grass that we see every spring. And again, you have seen this before, the Sumerian used this little piece of grass and the sound is either G or G, okay? So uh, the Chinese have this uh, very similar picture uh, pictograph and then uh, we uh, until this very day we still uh, hold on to the sound of Gai okay Gai is actually um, means you know grass you know wild grass reed and also uh, from this word we de develop into another word you know this has another pronunciation but for us you know visually it already give us the meaning of abundance and a luxurious growth of any plant, okay? So let's all go back to look at Sumerian. Sumerian finally developed into cuneiform. You will see that the piece of grass is uh, turned 90 degrees sideways and they give it a, a, a little headlight, bull head like that. But um, the sound still, you know, retain the same. Either, uh, other than meaning a piece of grass from this time on in Sumerian, this word already means you know the essence you know what is the essence but the essence of the key of anything so they already know that there is a key like a essence you know to spark life okay so you will see that also on the other side, Chinese uh, maintain the similar sound. It's gay. Gay for us Chinese, it actually means the key part, the pivot of something, very important part. And it also means a machine, you know, the acting movement part of the machine. So you will see that uh, actually from that, you will see the English word gist, which also links to the German word geist. Geist, of course, you understand it as a soul, and then just as also also the key, the, the pivot of something, right? And then it links to the um, uh, Greek word uh, kinesis, and kinesis, you know, also linked to the Chinese word kin, which is a very macho, you know, uh, movement, okay? So all these words were actually very, very close to each other from the very beginning. And of course, the other word I can show it to you is machina, machina in Latin, which is become your word machine. So you will see that at this way, at this time, you know, it's still as gi, kin, kin, uh, all with the G and the K sound, okay? So... Um, I, now I want you to pay attention to this little bull head right there. The Sumerian have this to show the spark, the key of life. The Chinese also have this, you know, in another plant in Chinese. And then you will see that this is also we how we express the growth tip, you know, where the vigor of life is, okay? So you will see that they also uh, share very, very similar conceptual and visual image of their understanding of the world, okay? So, um, um, as I told you, you know, the development of the A alphabet, which also become the leader of the alphabet. Why is it leading the alphabetic cycle? Because of its vigor, okay? So, because also from that time on, this bull had also become the representation of the alma, the soul, and in Sanskrit, it will be atma, and also the soul, and in English, you will understand this auto, or of course, 
course you know once you have this spark of light you begin your action so but a is not the uh, the alphabet I'm talking about I will continue on um, uh, but before I go on I want to point it to you this very interesting G and J the sound interchange it seems to be universal just as the um, example I gave to you this guys in German become just in English and in Chinese everything in Cantonese is G will be a J in I uh, will be a soft G which is a J in Mandarin and the same happened between Hebrew and Arabic. What is J sound in Arabic will become a G sound in, uh, in Hebrew. And also uh, between even between um, the Arabic uh, language itself, between different dialect and classical Arabic, whatever is classical Arabic J will be a G sound also in dialectic Arabic. Arabic. So you will see this very strange uh, uh, phenomenon happened in all the uh, languages, you know, most of the, I would say, most of the languages in the ancient world, okay? So um, I do not pretend that I know the reason, but I'm pointing out this to you. Hopefully I can find somebody who can also look into this, you know, from a different angle, from the Eurocentric view of understanding language, okay? And then the other way of looking at it is also sometimes even within one language, just like the English, you understand gene also, of course, gene is also the key of your life, right? Um, and then the other way they try to un uh, separate one thing from another is the gene. Of course, the gene has a, a little bit of negative intonation, but then uh, you will see that, you know, even though the sound it seems to the same gene and gene, but then visually they also use it, you know, to distinguish. So that tells us that in writing itself, sometimes we also need visual clue to give us distinction uh, other than just the sound, okay? This is a universal um, practice that a lot of the language has to use either we distinguish things by changing the sound or we distinguish the meaning by changing the visual uh, writing okay so uh, again, you know, again, this, as I said, you know, the grass is actually the key of the life itself. And again, uh, I will show you something by showing you a lot of Chinese writing. Uh, first of all, I show you this image that I see again and again when I travel to all those less developed country. Because when you are in a less developed environment, when you see something like this, you will be amazed at how different, you, you know, uh, function they can be can perform. You use the same object again and again, but in different situation, then they become a different thing. So let me show you now. First of all, if you put it on the floor, it is a mat, okay? And uh, all those pictographs are real Chinese, okay? So um, if you uh, use it, you know, to put things on, it become a basket, okay? And then if you put it on the floor also, you know, uh, after we ele elevate our sitting position, other than the mat it's also can be the representation of a stool and then if you put it straight of course it is a wall and then uh, if you uh, put it in a position that blocks an entrance it becomes the door and then uh, again if you put it up you know but then you fixed it in a fixed position and not moving then it become a fence but look at the Chinese writing you can actually see it very very easily but it is the same make you know but then it can perform so many different uh, functions but there are even more functions um, you put the same thing in the river it become a trap for to trap fish and if you put it into a, on uh, on top of a hole it become a trap a pitfall for animals to fall in so it becomes a, a trap okay so uh, if you use it as a hand net you know you can also scoop a fish you can also catch okay and then also if you uh, weave it a little bit tighter it become a sieve okay and then also it become a mesh tool you know for different purposes and also um, you can write things on it become a book in order for you to understand this is a real Chinese book in ancient time okay 
and of course other than the meaning of book you know if you put that you know uh, scroll you know uh, on top of a stand to uh, in a way to elevate its position is actually means a canon in Chinese so you can see that the same make of material we can, human being can actually think of so many use of it so that's why the same word uh, actually develop into so many many words later okay and look at this grass the gi and then there's another sound also for grass which sounds as sas and look at this you know the grass weave into a mat that's why the mat still carry the kit and the sa sound because the, this is already from the very origin so because we change the use of different things the sounds still actually remain no one go around and invent new sounds for that for that if you live in a very ancient environment you just develop whatever you have based on whatever you have okay so it is actually very easy to chase back to the very very core of the sound okay so again, the grass is symbol. You have just seen the Sumerian sign of Sars as the grass. And when you come to proto sinaitic it says the sound of Sart. You can see clearly it's a grass, okay? And then the Chinese grass, look at it, it's the same thing. But the sound doesn't stay with the grass in Chinese. There's, there's, the sound actually uh, stay around, you know, another symbol based on the grass with the ground uh, pointed there because it is a living grass okay and we have the sound of sound sound actually other than the living grass is actually the symbol of life and living as well okay so let's move on and to uh, back to the Hebrew to the other side of the world look at this sin and the shin look at how similar the shape is and then of course this shape you know even though you don't understand you know what this is you will see that the use of this is two sin or shin sound okay and let's look at Arabic the sin is like this and the shin uh, actually put three dots on top to distinguish the sin and shin sound and then you will see exactly the same thing the two actually pronounce the same um, but you can see clearly this is two repetition of the, the same character two times this repetition of the same character two times when you want to read it is actually hashish you should know the word hashish hashish means means the grass or the dry hay or the straw okay in ancient time this is very important because that's where you store the the, the, the hay or the, or the straw to feed the animal in the winter so by having grass you actually feed more life this is life feeding into more life okay so interestingly um, the Chinese also develop from the grass uh, this is the determinative in Chinese whenever we put two grass on top of any word it is visually telling the Chinese that this is a word that concerned with the grass so we use it as a visual part but interestingly we also repeat it twice and look at another Chinese word it actually has the word uh, the sound of sun sun actually means you know the multitude of living of living and also it means you know the herd of animals and then look at the Sanskrit sasa also means grass just look at all this very interesting development it is like a whole circle that everyone is sharing the same sound the same way of doing things and then uh, this is a Chinese poetry and you can see clearly that this is the repetition of this word there it says sang sang ke lo that means you know abundance multitude of Deers. This is definitely at a time, you know, this tribe of Chinese is actually, was actually herding deers at that time. You will see that they will use this, you know, a tons of grass, you know, tons of hay, tons of straw, actually produce tons of um, deer, of course. And interestingly, uh, later on in other episodes, I will tell you also, the sound of the deer is low or lu in Chinese and then uh, interestingly the lu is also abundance and also the deer in ancient Sumerian are, are they really coincident I don't think so because at that time they are really living uh, in a very very ecological world and everyone is following the same thing they understand that by 
protecting the grass, having a lot of grass, you are in turn, you know, feeding in a lot of animals itself. So it actually makes us ashamed of ourselves now that how we destroy our ecosystem, okay? So, but let me go back to my language research and you will see that this is a whole cycle of words, you know, all these uh, words, you know, sharing uh, according to the modern language, there should be different language family trees, but why are they all sharing the same sound for following the same way of, of um, trying to express themselves. Now let's go back to the Sumerian. Again, this is the grass, sars, and look at the sound. And I will show you why the shape is like that. And then the hieroglyph, you know, and as you can uh, imagine, the ancient uh, Egyptian world uh, is a desert world, you know. So uh, other than the, the the area along the Nile River, and in the contrast, you know, they have abundance of water along the Nile River. So this uh, water lily is a bit actually very abundant. So they use the sha, you know, to mean this water lily. Uh, uh, the way they use Sha is exactly, you know, the Sumerian, you know, in the um, Mesopotamian area to describe grass because this is what they have abundance in life. And this is exactly what the Hebrew, the Jews people could call Shoshana. Shoshana is actually the water lily. And then uh, you will see that they also use the water lily to mean abundance in hieroglyph. And if you compare this Sha with this Sha, and this sign is looks exactly the side way it, when they turn 90 degrees it seems that the Sumerians is also sharing the same sign you know to mean you know grass itself so um, different people have living in different geographic location some people look at grass you know as the um, as their source of life but some people look at the water lily as their, their symbol of life so it's understandable so it will be very very um, uh, odd you know if you will see the um, ancient Egyptian living in the desert using you know also grass as that so it's actually very very logical okay so the Sumerian also use this two sang she or z as the symbol of life so you will see that also this also follow one of the rule you know this bull head right there and then again I show you the Chinese way you know uh, but this is another direction that the language develop but you will say that why when you are showing all this you know why is all Greek you know because everyone believed that Greek is the origin of a lot of things but I will show you where um, Greek comes in from here you will see that the Greek also have the sound of sun but the sun actually look at this sun right there in Chinese but sun in, in Greek actually means something together or something alike or something the like look at that two by two it's exactly two things like okay so it means like from this sun it actually developed to another branch you know uh, where the words like same and similar comes because you know this is how uh, language gradually developed from the grass you know we gradually developed you know into a culture where we um, group into tribes and people and then that's how we use the word you know to describe you know every uh, thing as the same so let's uh, divert a little bit to look at how the ancients uh, used to express the idea of the same and something similar and it goes back to singular because if you love a group of things together it actually became becomes one and then it comes back to singular okay and look at this this is a hieroglyph you know Egyptian hieroglyph and as the number two it actually have the sound of sand very much like you know the um, the uh, Chinese sun, you know, having two things together or having the Greek sun uh, means uh, something alike, you know, or they have the sound, you know, as the E, you know, either you can represent it as a Y or represent it with two I, I, that's E, uh, elongated I sound, okay? So look at Chinese. Chinese have this, and in Chinese Cantonese, you know, we actually pronounce it as Yi. Yi for us means two. Two obviously is two things of the same, okay? So we have also, you know, when we draw three stroke, in Cantonese we pronounce it as Sam. Sam is three. 
three of the same kind, okay? But Sam in uh, Mandarin actually changed to San. Once again, it actually likes, it goes back to the Greek pronunciation. So you can see that even within Chinese, the Cantonese and the Mandarin has this kind of very interesting, um, very organized development, okay? So look at this. The hieroglyph also used these three to mean, um, to indicate visually anything plural. Uh, it seems that they don't have sound, but in Chinese, it still maintains this sound sound. And of course, you know, the, you have the Greek san. San, again, you know, it means something alike or means together or means something side by side. That's how the ancient, you know, express, you know, the... Um, something together okay so again the, you go back to the chinese we use you know two of this uh, uh grass symbol side by side to pronounce the song but for us other than the plant life we also you know uh, uh, extended a little bit to the animal life sun okay so but it actually means you know multiple a life itself it just doesn't mean just life it means multiple but also Chinese has the habit of jamming three things together to mean something multiple and and it is very very consistent and the um, and then <coughs> <coughs> this is the hieroglyph way of expressing something impressive that's how they also put three things together and then look at that. This is how the ancient uh, expressed the idea of multitude, gregarious, or something assimilate. When you group things together, you need to assimilate. Just like the idea of America, uh, different people come to America. That's why assimilation is such an important issue here in America. Because if you don't in, uh, assimilate, uh, uh, people will be very difficult to govern, okay? So, um, but then I will point it back, you know, other than this very abstract symbol of two or three, it actually uh, tells you uh, from the very beginning, there is also a sin and a sim in Chinese. You can see that it's actually from the very beginning of the plating technology. And sin and sim is actually means one, and sin is actually means a thread. Of course, it goes back to the technology of plating and weaving okay and then of course you know you go back to the even the English that the sim and the sin is also very very consistent and it also you know I point to the uh, very interesting of the N and M interchange just like the Chinese oh sorry and then um, okay I will stop right here and I hope I am going slower you can understand